Hello, and welcome back to our final session of our Early Childhood Family Leadership Series. My name is Sherelle Bethel, and I'm the Parent Training and Information Director here at Peak Parent Center. Today, you'll be hearing from two speakers, Ben Reapy and Danae Davison. Ben is a member of the Positive Early Learning Experiences Center at the University of Denver. He is on staff at the National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations and Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center. Ben's 13 years of experience as a Head Start teacher, coach, and trainer informs his work to support systems to implement inclusive policies and practices so every family and child feel they belong. Danae is co-hosting this webinar and is one of our parent advisors here at Peak. She has three children, one with Lennox Gestalt syndrome, who guides her passion for families and special education. You will hear from her first in this presentation series. Uh, this is the fourth series in the Early Childhood Family Leadership Series, Getting the Most Out of Special Education. This series is primarily focused on families with babies through kindergartners, but is still full of useful information for families with older children as well. This series was developed by the grant with a grant and guidance from two national partners, the Daisy Center and Center for Parent Information Resources. Links to the resources in this presentation will be available below this video. From the webpage for this webinar, just scroll down and click the button under resource files. After this session, we will send you a survey to get your feedback on what worked and what didn't. This is the first run through this series and your feedback is very helpful. This series is pre-recorded, so there are no live questions, but if you have any questions either right after you watch this video or any time in the future, you can always call Peak Parent, Peak Parent Center and ask to speak with the parent advisor. Our number is 719-531-9400. Just a note, we do not provide legal services or advice, and the information in this presentation is for general purposes. The third-party links we provide are not necessarily endorsed by PEAK, but are for your further information. This is the fourth and final session, and we will talk about getting the most out of your special education. This session, the sessions do build upon each other, so if you're joining us for the first time, we recommend going back and watching them all in order. Today, we will talk about what are the parts of the IEP? How do I know if it's a good IEP? How can I improve my IEP using indicators? What if I run into problems? I am overwhelmed. Why should I do this? Now I will hand this over to Danae. Thank you, Sherelle. Um, just to jump right in here. So main parts of the IEP and a little note, um, for those on an IFSP, that's a little bit different. And this is gonna be more focused on the Part B three to 21 students. Um, for Part C early intervention, the plan for your child is called an IFSP. Actually, it's an individualized family service plan instead of an individualized education program, the IEP. And some of the main differences are an IFSP is delivered in natural settings, um, often in the home or in a childcare setting. And it's also focused on the child's developmental needs and their family's needs, priorities, and concerns. But the IEP is the big jump over to school environments. And that one is focused on making progress academically and socially in a school setting. So those are the major differences. So today we're gonna delve into the IEP and how to make it work for your child. Um, there is no standard form and the IEPs do look really vastly different from school to school, but they will all address these five categories in some format or another. And so I'll talk about each of these categories and how they work together. The present levels of academic performance um, well, also also called academic achievement and functional performance, a plath, <laughs> you'll see that sometimes. Um, so this is about a comprehensive overview of your student's current abilities, including their strengths and their challenges. So this is the baseline. It serves as developing um, the place for developing goals and determining appropriate services. And just notice that term baseline data. We've been talking about that in session three. So when we talked about look, think, act in session three, this is the look part. Um, remember that part of what is important in look, in the look phase is to reserve judgment. And so there's, um, I don't know if you've heard the term diagnostic overshadowing. It's more of a medical term, but applied here would be like, for example, assuming something about a student um, before you've really seen the data, right? So you would just make an assumption like, oh, they have dyslexia, their reading comprehension will be bad. But we don't really know that that might not be true. So the important thing about this plaf about the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance 
is that if the testing doesn't match what you know about your child, um, you might want to ask some questions. Um, how was this data gathered? What kinds of tests were done? Um, when were the observations performed? And just kind of getting a bigger picture if it doesn't reflect what you know. And, you know, students perform very differently from the home setting to the school setting sometimes. So it's not that their results are wrong, but you definitely want to have, feel free to add your voice to it and add to those um, to that baseline data because your opinion and your perspective and your evidence about what happens at home or in outside of school settings is just as important. And you really want to get this part right because this part is what the rest of the IEP should stem from. Each step should build on the last. So that next step, the annual goals and progress monitoring. So annual goals should be based on those needs and strengths identified in that earlier step, the present levels. If the student is behind in math, there should be a math goal. Sounds so logical, right? If the student loves animals and struggles to talk to people, there could be a goal around sharing their interest in horses with a friend. These goals should be, should be clear and they should have... Um, a good formula. The good formula will be the SMART goals method, which I'll talk about later. Um, I'll share that in just a moment. There should be a plan around tracking these goals, just like the SIP in um, se session three, talking about, you know, we make a big six year plan. You can't just set it and forget it. You wanna like check in every so often and see, are we making progress? So same thing with IEP goals. You basically, you set your annual goals um, or six month goals or term goals. Um, but basically you wanna just keep periodically checking in. Maybe it's once a month, um, maybe it's once a week and just see how, how things are progressing in those goals so that you can make adjustments as you go. And with IEPs, if it's a minor adjustment, you can always, you don't have to be call a big giant IEP meeting. You can just, you can make minor changes um, with the teacher. Just make sure everything's documented um, in writing emails. If you have a conversation, just follow up with an email. That's just a, a good tip. But also, if there are bigger changes that you need to address or new information has come in or something big has changed, you can always at any time call an IEP meeting. It does not have to be the once a year one. That You have to have a once a year one, but you can do it more often than that. Um, so that next step, each step builds on the last accommodations and modifications. They are there to help the student reach their goals that you planned in the last step and your goals were planned from the baseline data, right? All makes sense. So accommodations um, might be something like noise canceling headphones or a quiet area to focus on projects. Um, accommodations mean that the information is the same as all the other students. It's just that they are, the student is with the IEP is interacting differently with that same information in a way that they need. Um, whereas modifications involve altering the curriculum ex expectations or outcomes and to better suit the student's abilities. Um, for example, so while the other students might be given multi-step instructions, the student who needs a modification might receive one step at a time, or they might receive a visual cue instead, or whatever helps them participate. And the goal is not necessarily that they you know, it doesn't have to be like, oh, they're going to match all the other students. They don't have to do that. The goal is actually ensuring that they do have meaningful learning activities and they keep learning alongside their same age peers. Okay, supplementary aids and services. So still building on every step before. Sometimes accommodations and modifications aren't necessarily the whole picture to support progress on goals. So public education, it offers additional supports, aids, and services. And this enables the student to be educated, especially with non-disabled peers to the maximum extent possible. So this might include things like assistive technology, one-on-one -on -one aids, and behavior intervention plans. Placement, so each step building up to this last one, which is placement. Placement refers to the setting in which the student will receive their education and services as outlined in all these other steps. Um, so it is determined based on the student's unique needs and it ensures they are placed in the least restrictive environment, the LRE, where they can make meaningful progress. So be careful here because this is not an assignment of school location or choice, school choice. This is not about that necessarily. This is about program placement. Um, so somewhere on your child's IEP, it will have data that ties to indicator five, and this is placement data. 
Um, the most inclusive placement is inside a regular classroom in whatever school has the supports needed. Um, inside the regular class, 80% or more of the day. So that means that no more than, you know, 19% of the day is spent in pullouts with specialists or in a separate classroom. Um, or if the IEP team has identified a need for more frequent time with specialists and being outside the general education classroom, the student might be pulled out between 79% and 41% of their day. And that would not be considered a change of placement to going anything on that range. Um, if students need a lot of support in the reg, um, a lot of support, then they might be out of the general ed classroom 40% of the day or less. Um, and when I say regular classroom, there's definitions around this too. It just means that there are fewer than 50% of the students in that classroom with IEPs. Um, it comes out of recognizing that it's a best practice for children with IEPs to be represented in classrooms with natural proportions to the community where they live. Um, but we're gonna revisit that 79 to 41% category because it is very wide. Um, goes from most of their day in the regular classroom to less than half. So that is really broad. And I've seen so many IEPs where they don't necessarily specify anything other than 79%, but that gives a really, really big range. And so you might not even know, you might think that your child is most of the time, you know, 79% of the time in a general education classroom, but looking through the actual minutes of things, you might find it's, it could be less than half. So it's broad. Um, and that's something to really pay attention to. And that's why it's really important to notice what you've specified in the IEP. So if you have a lot of adult specialists on there, then that might be a lot of pullout time. Um, sometimes adult specialists will push into a classroom and work with a student in the general ed classroom. You have to figure out what that looks like, what that means. It could be, you know, is that a separate table? Are they kind of pulled out in that way? Or is it, you know, more natural? Are there, and using peer supports is a great way to try to like keep skill sets moving along in a way that is not so like here, you're gonna go over here and study with this person, but a way to like apply the knowledge. And you can put those in the goals too about peer supports. Um, so you have to look at your goals. If your goals are really very heavy on the academic side, focused on, you know, make or learning their ABCs more than making friends and there's no making friends goals, then maybe they're gonna end up out of the classroom more. So you should be careful about how much time is planned to be away from their peers. Cause if you want them to make friends and be with their same age peers, there's a balance there and it's all a balance because of course you want them to do both and that's the really tricky part of things. And this is where it is helpful to have an idea of your hopes and dreams for your child to guide you through things. Um, that could be a whole other series. Anyway, how do I know if it's a good IEP? So you are the expert, you know, know your child across the years and through situations, you're the only one that has that information. So comprehensive assessment and data. A good IEP is based on thorough and recent evaluations that provide a clear understanding of the student's strengths, weaknesses, and needs. And it should include input from various sources, including yourself, teachers, specialists, um, anyone who can contribute a well-rounded view of the student's abilities and challenges. Having clear and measurable, measurable goals is important. An IEP should have specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, those are the SMART goals, tailored to the student's unique needs. And these goals should be clear enough that progress can be easily tracked and evaluated, so they don't need to be super complicated. Um, individualized services and supports, so detailing out the services, the accommodations, the modifications that the student might need. And that can also include related services, speech therapy, occupational therapy, or um, classroom accommodations, extra time on tests, uh, preferential seating. Regular progress monitoring is important. There should be a clear plan for how the student's progress towards those goals will be monitored and reported on. And regular updates to parents and adjustments in the IEP can be made, need, um, can be made based on the student's progress. So if they meet a goal faster than expected, you can email and adjust and, and make that goal, change that goal to be more ambitious. Or if it just seems that goal is way off, you can always adjust. You don't have to call a full IEP meeting. You can just adjust as needed. And that's why it's important to keep checking in too. Collaboration and communication. Um, the IEP 
should involve ongoing co collaboration between the school, the parents, the student when appropriate. Effective communication can ensure that everyone understands what's happening, understands their roles and how to best support the student. Also regular meetings and having open lines of communication can shortcut any challenges that might come up. Um, having those good relationships is to me all about the communication. So, and it just needs to be set up with whatever works best for you and your child's teachers. Um, I've had teachers before with my daughter who is on an IEP. Um, sometimes they find it easier to just give me a call at the end of the day or end of the week rather than writing things down. Um, and I've had other teachers that love the notebook that goes back and forth. And that tends to be a really good way. It's just a way of communicating even what's going on at home. So if she had a really bad night of sleep, um, they might need to know that information. Or if her if she has a new medication, um, all of those things can be written down and then they can send me a note back. She had a great day. She did this today. She seemed really sleepy, things like that. So you just have to figure out what works for you. Student-centered approach. So an IEP should reflect the student, the individualized piece, right, of the I, the I of the IEP. The student's interests, preferences, and aspirations. Um, eventually, the, your student might be involved in their own IEP and helping set their own goals. And that's a great goal to motivate towards as they get older. And Ben's going to give you some great examples of these SMART goals. I'm just gonna give you the quick overview here. So SMART goals, finally, we'll talk about it. So specific, uh, it's an acronym you can see. Uh, specific, the goal should clearly define what is expected, who is involved, what's gonna be accomplished. The goal should be measurable. Um, you have to find some way of quantifying it so that you can track progress and determine when that goal has been met. It should be achievable. It should be realistic and attainable for the skill set of your child considering their current abilities and developmental stage. Sometimes things have to be broken into smaller and smaller pieces, but it's all progress along a line. And it should be relevant. So the goal should be meaningful and directly related to the child's needs, their interests, and all of the things identified in their IEP. Um, it can be, usually this can be tied to uh, grade level standards. And also it should be time bound. So a goal should have a specific time frame around which it will be achieved. I'll give you a kind of bad example, which was one where the student had a goal of becoming an astronaut someday. But that was really, that was way out of the timeline for one year for anybody, right? I mean, unless, you know, you've been studying your whole lifetime and then you probably don't have, you know, your goal is obvious at that point. You probably don't need to write it down in that same way. Um, so that is my bad example. Now, Ben is going to give you some excellent examples. Thanks, Danae. Um, yeah, so we're talking about developing ambitious social goals. And it's important for families um, to know that there's legal precedent um, on your side uh, and that, in fact, um, there's a, a case that happened in Colorado, Andrew F. versus Douglas County School District in 2017. And this case clarified the standards for what constitutes appropriate education for students with disabilities under IDEA. Um, so the background for the Andrew F case, Andrew F was a student with autism who attended public school in Douglas County, Colorado, and his parents were dissatisfied with the progress, and they argued that his IP was not designed to deliver educational benefits. After withdrawing Andrew from the public school and they enrolled him in a private school that specialized in educating children with autism, the parents sought reimbursement for the, from the school district for private school tuition, and they argued that the district had failed to, apply, to provide um, faith of free appropriate public education as required by IDEA. Well, the lower courts found against the family, um, they applied the standard of 1982 Supreme Court uh, case Board of Education versus Rally, which held that an IEP needed to be reasonably calculated to enable the child to receive educational benefits. The lower courts interpreted this to mean that minimal progress was sufficient given his circumstances. But they continued to push it into the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court unanimously reversed the lower court's decision, significantly raising the standards for IEPs. 
Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the court, stated that IDEA requires an educational program reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in the light of the child's circumstances. This ruling emphasized that one, IEP goals must be ambitious. The court highlighted that every child should have a chance to meet challenging objectives. An IEP must be crafted to ensure that the child has an opportunity to make significant progress. This does not mean that every child must achieve the same academic milestones, but the goals set should appropriately be appropriately challenging given the child's unique situation. Number two, they found that progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. The standard for measuring if an IEP is appropriate is not fixed. Instead, it should be tailored to the child's specific disabilities, strengths, and needs. The IEP must be designed in a way that allows the child to advance from grade to grade, uh, provided it's realistic for the child. Number three, substantive, <coughs> substantive standard for FAPE. The ruling established that the IEP must be reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. This is more substantive standard than the de minimis or trivial progress that was accepted under previous interpretations. It requires higher expectations for educational benefits. So what are the implications? Andrew F. decision has made significant implications for special education. It means increased expectations for children um, who are on IEPs. The IEP development uh, must be carefully considering the child's unique uh, circumstances. Um, the, there's, uh, there's accountability. The ruling provides that parents have stronger grounds to challenge inadequate IEPs and advocate for their programs that include genuine educational benefits. And in summary, NGRF case reinforced the requirement that IEPs must be ambitious and tailored to each child's unique needs, ensuring meaningful education progress rather than minimal advancement. In this case marks a critical shift toward higher education standards and greater accountability in special education. Okay. So what we know about a lot of families, what I know as a, as a father of a child who's who's on an IEP is that a lot of us have goals uh, that are beyond um, beyond just being able to do certain physical activities that we're hoping for social outcomes as well. And we know from the research, from the literature that children who have better social outcomes do better academically, do better socially, have better longer lives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I encourage you to get your IEP team to write ambitious IEP or IFSB team to get ambitious social goals woven into the process. You have the right to ask for what you need for your family based on your context, by based on your family priorities, you have the right to ask for those things and the law is on your side. So I just, I just wanna say that out front. The ch uh, what what um, Danae just shared is the um, serum <laughs> to the biggest challenge around social goals is that folks sometimes don't know exactly um, how to get there, but by making a, a smart goal, meaning the specific, measurable, attainable, um, realistic, timely, uh, smart goal, by having that, you can make something functional. And what I mean by functional is that it it is something that applies to not just you know your the, the child's time when they're at school but also applies to your their time with their siblings at home or um you know challenging times routines of the day like say uh, brushing your teeth or going to bed on time or um interacting with grandma <laughs> going to the park going to the grocery store, it's functional. It's something I can use in multiple different situations and it helps me get my needs met meaningfully. Um, and so these are things you can write at goals that address so the specific social needs. And so I'm gonna share a couple of examples um, of things that, that meet those needs. Um, indicator seven um, from IDEA talks about 
uh, goals around social emotional outcomes. And so we've linked both here the, the social outcomes, um, also with a, uh, a, a teaching strategies goal, which is an assessment tool that a lot of preschool programs use. Um, and so it's nice if you're, uh, if you have a program, if you're working with a program that has IEP uh, TS Gold, it's nice to link it so that they don't see this as adding more to their um, to their plate. It's something they should be doing. They may be doing if they use TS Gold already. Um, and a lot of and the and TS Gold also kind of goes into uh, uh, elementary schools. There's some some uh, other pieces of that can that can go farther as well. So um, smart goals. Uh, around social, emotional, we're gonna target five areas here. The first one is developing positive relationships. So supporting a child to, to bond with their peers and also to bond with the adults in their lives. Um, by the, so here's an example of a goal that's been developed, that's been that made into a SMART goal example. <clears throat> By the end of the school year, our child will demonstrate the ability to engage in positive interactions with peers by initiating, that's one of the areas that they can support, initiating and responding to social interactions in four out of five opportunities as measured by teacher observations and TS Gold objectives. TS Gold objectives are our child will greet peers during circle time with verbal and nonverbal communication in four out of five opportunities. Our child will participate in cooperative play activities in one or more with one or more peers for at least 10 minutes without um, much with minimal up adult support. So that's a way of taking this big goal of peer, uh, positive peer interactions, right? Instead of saying something like he's gonna make three friends that's a great. That's a great possible outcome. But you, what you want is something that is functional, something that they, you can measure, something that you can see them doing in multiple situations. You could do this at the park. You could do. You could have four out of five social positive social opportunities um, with their cousin. Like those are all things that can happen. They're measurable, and they're meaningful. Smart goal number two is emotional regulation. So the adult version of emotional regulation is um, you're uh, driving in your car and somebody cuts you off. If you're able to emotionally regulate uh, as an adult, that means you can calm down without um, expressing things negatively, without going into road rage, right? So the, the, that's emotional regulation for adults. Um, and it's the same for children, right? Um, somebody takes the block that they want they, are they able to calm their body down? So in this, uh, for the IEP goal, that might be our child will use appropriate strategies to regulate emotions. That means calm their body down when they're upset uh, during structured and unstructured activities in four out of five observation, uh, observations as measured by the teacher and TS goal objectives. So a couple real specific examples would be deep breathing, or um, other learned strategies to calm down. They went to the quiet tent. They, they, um, they independently went to the quiet tent. They sat down. They played with the teddy bear, and then they came out when they were calmed down. Um, that's emotional regulation. Got a couple more in here. Social rules and routines. Routines are super important. You know this because of bedtime. You know this because of uh, meal time. You know this because of when they're playing together. Can they? Can they hang? Can they hang out uh, meaningfully? So, in four out of five opportunities, a child will demonstrate um, an understanding of the classroom rules and routines by following them independently. They come to circle time. They put their art materials away at the end of of, of art time, like the rules say. Um, they line up when we're asked to line up. Um, transitions will between activities following the classroom activities. Uh, with minimal adult prompts in four out of five uh, activities, or they will participate in the group by taking turns and waiting for their turn in four out of five examples. And then developing self-confidence. Um, this is about being able to express their preferences, 
for for what they want um, or for starting a, a play activity um, and encourage asking a friend to play with them to join to join with them so um, doing that in four out of five opportunities and so um, you can see how a teacher could just say today did that happen did it was there an opportunity for it to happen and did they do it like we're in centers so they ask a friend to join them they were in centers and they knew um, and they and they asked for a turn when it when when it was when it was appropriate so those are those are goals number four three and four and the final one this last one is really a uh, speaking of ambitious, this is a really important one for preschoolers and for all children to have the ability to problem solve. And it requires you to have been building on all those previous skills in order to be successful with it. Because a lot of times during the course of problem solving, you'll run up against high levels of emotion or you will need to ask, request a, a play idea. So, um, or a request a solution. So, um, so there you are. So solving solutions is a is a is a tricky one. And don't worry, I'm gonna end uh, and just momentarily with a couple of examples of resources that you can, as family members, can use to either build your IEP or just use in general. Um, so, uh, problem solving and social skills. So. By the end of the school year, your child will use problem solving skills to resolve conflicts with peers in four out of five opportunities. Um, that might be asking for help or a peer when you're faced with a conflict, or better yet, uh, will suggest solutions or accept solutions um, to resolve conflicts in four out of five opportunities. So, um, I'm going to take just a second to share a resource, if that's OK. Um, this this is an NCPMI. It's a free, uh, it's one of the centers for early childhood. And it's got lots of free resources for classrooms, but also for families. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show what the site looks like and how to get Yeah, so this is uh, NCPMI, um, Pyramid Model Innovations. Um, it's a national center for early childhood, and they have lots of resources for both classrooms and also for families. Um, and I'm going to show you how to get here. The link on the on the piece is to get to file the child engagement. So if you go to NCPMI sites and you go to family engagement, this is what it looks like. But um, this is why I'm showing you, because you click on it and you're like, wait, this isn't sharing anything. But then look at these. Ooh, there you go behavior regulation, friendship skills, emotional literacy. So if there's any specific, I can calm down strategy, if there's any specific strategy you're hoping to look for, you can look on this website and they'll give examples and they'll also give you visuals. This is all free. It's a national center. So you've, you've already paid for it. It's, it's free. It's free for you. So, um, uh, it provides things. It also provides things in different languages. So um, there's a lot of things that have been translated into Spanish, some into Somali, some into Hmong. Um, but uh, so the problem solving steps, for example, you have the process of like, how do you select a solution? They have there, and then they have examples of like, what are solutions? What are meaningful solutions? And you can have a home edition solution kit that you could print off. And so when your child is like, I need a solution, and you say, how about we get a timer or we go through, we can go through them on a ring, um, look at the different solutions. So that is NCPMI and that's on your resources. Um, that's meaningful. And the other one on the resources page that we have there is for ECTA. And um, that really, there's a link to like how to develop functional goals. It's really for the teams of the people you're working with. If they're new to the job, it happens. Um, and you'd like to provide them a resource, or if you'd like to look at it yourself, you've got, if you're like, I've got extra time and I like, like, like that happens, but um, that's another resource that you could, you could look at for yourself to just help think about how do we develop these functional goals for my family. But the, 
the whole kit and caboodle is is that your voice is invaluable your opinions are invaluable for the development of a meaningful iep and um the law is on your side um and knowing that knowing um knowing about andrew f as a, a and it being <laughs> One of the unfortunate and fortunate things is it happened in Colorado. So if you can um, have that in, on your on your plate, uh, you can share it with with the teams that you're working with. If they start giving you, we have low expectations for your child. Um, we have, uh, they won't say that, but they'll 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 show it to you. If they say to you, um, uh, here's an IEP because it's the same one that I use with you know I've used this same thing with other children with autism if it feels to you like it's it's pre-made iep that's not meaningful for your kid and so um it's okay you're the child's first advocate and these other folks should be your child's advocate as well so um they're going to be in the classroom so you you want them to be on the same page with you um uh, and a, we're we're just really grateful that you took the time to to check out these resources we're really grateful for your for your time in this in this webinar series, and I'm going to hand it back uh, to Danae. Thank you, Ben. That was so so good. I'm really glad you're able to join us today. Um, just a great summary of the Ender F case and how we can use that and why we should. And those examples were awesome. And just trying to figure out how to actually make this stuff happen on the ground. So I really loved that. Um, and just a reminder, so the, they call it a guide to parents' rights in special education, also used to be called the procedural safeguards. And this is here for you to troubleshoot, problem solve, anything that comes up in your IEP meetings or with the schools. And you can also call Peak Parent Center. So Peak Parent Center is funded to help you, uh, parents and educators, and people, educators call us all the time too, and social workers call us, people call us, and can ask us questions, ask parent advisors questions around anything in special education. And we also have a list of resources too, so you can call us for other things, any random question really, we are really good researchers and we'll try to get you an answer. And then, but our specialty, our bread and butter is in special education. And so you can call us at 719-531-9400 or email us at parent um, parent advisor at peakparent.org and our support is always free and we love to chat so just give us a call the last thing I wanted to leave you with is I think in the notes I had something about I'm feeling overwhelmed why should I do this I know I just I we did a lot of information in this series in very compressed packages just throwing it out to you so um, I know it's a lot but You'll get through it and you can call us for help. And I will leave you with this video about friendship and inclusion and good outcomes. It's a good summary for everything we've been talking about. These two little girls are, um, this is from Colorado. This is actually a Department of Education video. And these two little girls, one has an IEP, one doesn't, but both of them through their friendship are able to improve their academic and social goals. So it's very cute. I will leave it with you. And thank you again for joining. This story is really about friendship and inclusion. <laughs> I have a very diverse classroom. I have kids of all different ethnicities and abilities. And I think it's important to have inclusion in the classroom. I have typically developing kids and kids with IEPs, and they have those peer models all the time. It helps my kids with their IEPs develop even further than working with the speech language pathologist once a week. They can get it every single day with the kids around them as they're playing in the classroom, then it's just going to help them even more. Very Mixed abilities in a group not only helps my kiddos with their language development, but it also helps the typically developing kids in my class learn patience and acceptance of those kids who may behave a little differently than what they've encountered before. 
Evelyn is a fun-loving and happy little girl. She loves to be creative and she loves to play. Pretty much anything you put in front of her, she'll make into some kind of game and have fun with it. My daughter is a very smart little girl. She loves to play with her toys, with her friends, and do new things. And she likes to sing, play outside, to go to the park. Evelyn has a language delay. At the beginning of the school year, her mother was concerned about her language and any kind of developmental delay. So before the school year started, her mother took her in for an evaluation, and they did say that there may be some kind of delay. Coming into the school year, Evelyn did not talk a ton, not speaking a lot of English. And if she did talk, her speech wasn't recognizable. Aiden is definitely a leader. She um, is a very great helper in the classroom. Jaden started off the year as kind of a shy kid. You would talk to her and she would try to hide behind her parents or her grandmother. She wouldn't participate a lot. Before this year, it was um, hard to have her open up. She was really shy. She was always clinging to myself, to her mother, to her grandparents, her aunts. Yeah, it was just really hard for her to want to open up and do new things. As the school year started, the girls kind of found each other and developed a friendship. You're going to do the itsy bitsy spider? Yep. Who are you making, Jaden? Girls start hanging out outside of classroom based on me. Jaden and Evelyn are in the half day class, so Evelyn's mother needed somebody to watch Evelyn after class ended. I asked her mom if she can pick up Evelyn from school, and she loves to go to Jaden's house. They get along pretty good. So after school, depending on the type of weather or what's going on, uh, we'll either come out here to the playground and have fun, or on a cloudy or rainy day, we'll go inside the apartment and watch cartoons and have a little snack and just relax, read a book or two. She needs a friend. She's the only girl in the house, so it's helping her a lot. I saw changes in Evelyn right away. Her language definitely started to develop more. That was the big thing. She also had a friend in the classroom to kind of help her out when she did not understand what was going on. So Jaden took her under her wing, was able to help her. So Evelyn started understanding the routine more, started playing with other kids more too. <laughs> is helping Evelyn a lot. She didn't talk a lot. Well, nothing. And now she's talking more. She's, she doesn't get frustrated anymore. Come and get me. I think it's helping her because Jaden talks and now she's starting talking a lot now that she is with Jaden. What so what do you think this is? That's scissors. Art. Art. Good, Jaden. Changes in Jaden, I saw, were her listening, definitely. At the beginning of the year, she did have a little bit of trouble listening and following directions from the teachers, but I think once she became kind of a leader in the classroom, took other kids under her wing, her listening definitely improved. Um, it's impacted my daughter because she's been able to learn how to deal with language barriers and with different cultures, different backgrounds, learning curves. It's really improved her social skills. She was a little shy at first, but now I like that she's more open and she's willing to try new things. And in general, her development throughout this school year has been a wonderful thing. Before school, uh, her behavior was horrible. I'm sorry. She would start screaming, crying. But now I can go everywhere with her. She is calm. She's trying to communicate to us. I think she's a different person. She's a completely different girl. She is. 
and it's great for us as a family. We're really proud of her. She's doing great. I think the power of friendships is as powerful as teacher-facilitated learning, and Evelyn has friends and a neighborhood and community that's here to support her. It just made sense to be able to help them out and be able to take care of Evelyn after school. Kids with special needs uh, learn faster with other kids. That's what I think that's really important. We're really happy that she has Jaden as a friend. I think an inclusive classroom is just kind of natural. Kids deserve to be with their friends, with their neighborhood peers. I think it's just so natural that I can't even imagine another way of organizing classrooms. Thank you.